Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, we represent clients in multiple sectors and multiple specialties, especially healthcare. This season, our theme is Specialty Spotlight, where each episode will visit about some of the nuances that can be found from a business and healthcare perspective in the various practice specialties. Yes, and Michael, before we, we bring on today's guests, I actually have a question for you. Do you know who Sir Edmund Hillary is? I always like it when you ask questions that are super obvious. I know the answer to, yes. but you could pretty much know that if you ask me if I know someone who has the, and it goes by sir, that I don't know them. I don't know any sirs. Oh, so no, okay. I don't know. Yes. Sir Hillary. Sir, <laughs> sir, our, our guest wants to answer now. Uh, uh, sir Hilly was from New Zealand and he became the first known climber to confirm to reach the top of Mount Everest, May 29th, 1953. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Follow-up question for you. Do you know who, who is Alan Shepard? Brad, I have no idea. I don't know what oh you're doing. Oh, my God. Today. You're killing me. On May 5th, 1961, Alan B. Shepard became the first American in space doing a suborbital flight in Mercury capsule named Freedom 7. Okay. Well, keep going. All right. One more question for you. I think we're going to have another failure here. Do you know who is Daniel Hale Williams? <laughs> I can start making something up, but it's, <laughs> it's going to fail pretty quickly. I have no idea. All right. Daniel Hale Williams was the first known doctor to perform a successful open heart surgery during an emergency procedure in 1893. Also, another fun fact, Dr. Williams was born in 1858 in a small town in, P in Pennsylvania. He was the fifth of seven children, son of a barber, and found the first ever known black owned hospital in America. All right. Well, uh, you, I am struggling to connect the dots here. I do have a theory. Okay. You, you're really bearing all this around the fact that you asked if I knew a sir and you know that there's our guest is named Brad and you're wanting me to distinguish <laughs> the two of you by calling you sir Brad. Well, that's actually a really good theory so far. I'm, I'm really into it's it. It's not going to happen. Okay. Well, all right. So, you know, I think one of the things that all our audience knows is when you're the first to do something, it can be rewarding, but at the same time, challenging, right? We had someone who was the, the first to climb, known to climb Mount Everest, the first American to go in the space, the first doctor to sit there and do an open heart surgery in an emergency procedure. And there's a rumor that today's guest may be one of the first people to introduce Botox to his patients in the state of Kentucky. I want to hear the story, but let's bring on today's guest. And you may call me Sir Brad afterwards. Sure. Yeah. And we can then next week do the world's shortest podcast and talk <laughs> about the things that you were the first to accomplish. <laughs> but, Fair enough. Okay. Dr. Brad Calabrese is joining us today. He is a graduate of Indiana University Medical School. He completed residencies in both general surgery and plastic surgery at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Completed a cosmetic and breast surgery fellowship with Dr. Pat Maxwell. He began his plastic surgery practice in Louisville, Kentucky in 1997. He has dual clinical faculty appointments with the Departments of Plastic Surgery at the University of Louisville and the University of Kentucky. He director of Aesthetic Surgery Fellowship endorsed by the Aesthetic Society. He's board certified plastic surgeon. He has been uh, awarded numerous top doc awards by both patients and peers. Both Brad and I and uh, I think Alex have shared the stage with uh, Dr. Calabrese, I'm going to go that route instead of the Sir Brad for you. <laughs> um, he is so he's a prolific speaker, speaker and teacher. He's the uh, founder and owner of Calo Aesthetics Plastic Surgery Center and Calo Spa Rejuvenation Centers. And I hope I got all of that right. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, that was all right. Um, I always find it interesting. I have to go back, and I'm like, oh boy, it's been 25 years that I've been in practice. Um, which is kind of shocking because you know how it is. It always seems like it's about somewhere about seven or eight years, more than 25 years. So yeah. I, nobody's asking me anymore 
um, what's my future plans? And other than like, what's my exit strategy? Um, <laughs> how many more years are you going to practice? You know, you're not retiring yet. It's the most common thing I get. And I go, is that where I am? Is that where <laughs> my career? So. Well, that's okay, uh, Brad. You know, Michael's been practicing uh, law for like 900 years. So, uh-huh. you know, don't worry about it. Yeah, I Actually, Sir Brad over here has is in his 25th year of practice right now as well. That's true. Yeah, well, that, you, I think that we clearly parents named their children Brad during our generation, I guess. Yes, um, I guess so. Well, well, all right, Brad. In, in the story of, of first, I want to, yeah. you know, like I said, I heard this is a rumor, but I'd love to hear where you truly one of the first physicians to bring Botox to the state of Kentucky. Yeah, I was probably the first. Um, it was because nobody was really doing it when I came into town. Shortly thereafter, um, it kind of sort of caught on. So I started practice in Louisville and I came from Los Angeles and then through Nashville with Pat Maxwell. So I came from LA and I thought the idea when I came to Louisville, quite frankly, um, it seemed like patients perceived it as sort of sleepy and sort of like as, you know, old fashioned surgery. So they really wanted to have more modern aesthetic practices. They felt that they would have to go to one of the coast to be able to get that, go to New York. Many um, of the established um, people and socialites of Louisville actually would always go out of the city um, to get their treatments, uh, like facelifts, et cetera. Um, and I thought that we could bring, you know, I came from Los Angeles, would bring modern medicine, modern plastic surgery um, to Louisville um, community. And, you know, one of those was just Botox, which I had been using, um, had learned at my residency in Los Angeles. Only uh, one doctor that I know of at the time in LA had just started to use it. A guy named Gareth Wooten, um, who is now pretty much retired, but he did all the celebrities' um, facelifts. He was the celebrity facelift surgeon um, at the time. And he was, so he clearly thought outside the box, was looking at things. Um, that's where I got introduced to it. Um, so shortly thereafter, when I was in practice, um, I thought it was a nice thing to introduce into the practice. And so what what is funny, I'll tell you one story about it. So it is 1997, and I'm putting botulism toxin in people. This is five years before it's FDA approved for cosmetic uses. Um, I was brand new in town. Nobody knew who I was. So I'm sure it was a touch scandalous. And there was a one. <laughs> and if you know anything about Botox, you know it lasts about three or four months, and it goes away. So there was one rumor, because people love rumors when you're in new in town, and it was that I was getting sued for a Botox treatment going bad, going bad. I heard of when I was getting my getting my haircut, um, and they, that this rumor was going around. And I said, well, I don't think that's true, but if it is, they're probably going to drop the lawsuit in about four months um, because <laughs> <laughs> everything will go back to normal. It will be that. So, and it wasn't true. Um, and as it's turned out, Botox is... He clearly everybody knows what's happened to the toxin market um, around the country, around the world. It's now, I mean, it's as, as common a name as any other pharmaceutical name there is out there. Um, it is the number one most recognizable pharmaceutical name in the, in the country. So how different it's been in the 25 years. So I was the first to bring it to Louisville. That's so awesome. I love it. That's fascinating, too. I'm just thinking about... Uh, it, it, how widely accepted it is now to be kind of there on the forefront where you're trying to convince people to, uh, you know, that this foreign substance is going to make them look better. Uh, you know, patients have a lot of trust in me now, but, you know, back then I was just so unknown. I, I must look back today and go, well, that was kind of crazy. I don't know how I, that was perceived by some because I, the first time I ever heard of it with Dr. Wooten, I was like, are you kidding me? I am definitely not injecting botulism toxin into somebody um, for a cosmetic reason. So, you know, but at that time also, um, what was new, which you, there was even the name of medical spa or a medi spa. Um, so in 1997, um, I was introducing the concept into my practice that we are something more than surgeons. We are aesthetic doctors for our patients and that we should try to bring all of that into our practice to help them aesthetically along the way because we were getting more and more good non-surgical options for them like laser devices and toxins and then became fillers and all the things that we know today, microdermabrasion and all those things. So we brought skincare into the practice um, in 1997, which I think was very new for plastic surgery back then. Um, and so I think it was part of all of that Botox fit right in with the idea of a mini spa. That's fascinating. And we know where that is today too, right? Yeah, right. Uh, because- yeah. It's, 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 yeah, completely different. I mean, and we can, 
you know, when, when people ask if we ever heard of a, a Medi spa or a med spa, you know, eight years ago, we're laughing because of course, you know, they didn't call it that, but all of our plastic surgeons have had some variation of that. The early, early adopters like yourself back in the nineties, but there's not many, most of them uh, came several years after that. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think that is one of the challenges um, that face us um, in aesthetic medicine, um, because in the past, um, most of those treatments were in the hands of people, doctors, who had spent most of their career training for, preparing for, um, treating patients aesthetically, dealing with the, the emergence of new techniques and how you bring them in and make them safe and yet very effective for our patients. We had our whole reputation on the line to make sure we only bring to them things that we think are effective and are safe for them. Um, and that's where it was. Um, and today, as you well know, it has emerged be well beyond the hands of plastic surgeons or dermatologists um, into what we would call non-core people and trying to keep that same level of safety and efficacy um, from non-physicians um, and people that maybe got a weekend course um, as it relates to that, um, is really a challenge. And, and it's not that I'm necessarily against it. I just think it is a challenge that we need to uh, find a way to address. And I think nobody's better to address that than the experts and the plastic surgeons um, that can help forge a way that will keep it safe and yet be accessible accessible to um, patients in an affordable way. That's really interesting. And I'm going to pivot and go back in time a little bit um, did tell us what drew you to plastic surgery as a specialty when you were in training? Well, you know, I think it wasn't it wasn't too complicated. Um, you know, I had it when I was in college. I had a teacher of mine, a nutrition teacher, um, Brenda um, Sands, and she said um, that she her sister had been in a car accident and she was um, had plastic surgery, and she was so impressed with the plastic surgeons and she knew my personality. And she said. She had an epiphany and she came to me. She was like, and she was like, I know what kind of doctor you should be. You absolutely should be a plastic surgeon. And the truth is, this is in 1983. Wow. And so a long time ago. Um, and I had, I did not know what a plastic surgeon was. I, I had per se never heard a, the term a plastic surgeon. Um, so how, I don't know. I lived in Indiana. I don't know if everybody else knew what they were, but back then it wasn't talked about. I didn't know anybody that ever had plastic surgery. Um, and so I didn't know what she meant actually. And then she kind of described it. And I knew that I knew there was something called a facelift. So I kind of, Oh, that's who does facelifts. And then I forgot about it. Kind of, I mean, I, I had it in the back of my mind. So when I was in my third year of medical school, so in like 1987 or um, 88, um, I did a rotation. I, thought, you know, I really don't want to be a surgeon. And so let's get surgery out of the way. So my first two rotations in my third year when we went to clinicals was to do general surgery for the first month. And the second month was a specialty. And I went, oh, I'll do plastic surgery because yeah. that's what Brenda, you know, Brenda Sands told me to do. Um, and I did that rotation very naively, I would say. And what's interesting is it's strange. Like, you know, you know, in a year or two, you have to sort of figure out what you want to spend the rest of your life doing. Right. And you don't really know that much about any of these specialties. But when I did that month, um, I absolutely knew. Um, I was like, oh, no, yeah, nope, I'm a surgeon. 100% I'm a surgeon. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. And so then you have to do five years of general surgery, two years at that time, two years of plastic surgery. I did a fellowship after that. And that's after eight years. It's like 15 and a half years of training. And that's a lot to bite off in uh, 1988 or 89. Yeah. Um, um, but that's what I did because I thought it was the, the balance of, um, a surgical, the, just being a surgeon, but it's so artistic and it's so creative. And that's exactly why my teacher had said to me, um, they she thought I should be a plastic surgeon. Um, you know, and ultimately it was like, I just had to close my eyes and do the training, um, because it was my perfect career. Um, and it did deliver to my, my spirit and soul, um, what would, would fulfill me. And so that's, I, so that's how I did it. Very much, I did a rotation. I went, okay, that's that's you're right. That's exactly who I am, and that's my gonna be my career. So, did you ever go back and thank Brenda? I didn't because I never got back to the college. Um, so just know, and she was my nutrition teacher. So really, we were in the sciences. I was in the sciences, 
but I believe nutrition was important for medicine. So she was more in like the home ec department. So, you know, it's not something we got that much relationship with, but um, we became very close friends. Um, you know, I was always a good student, always the best student in my class. Um, because I graduated number one in my college class. So, you know, she got close to your professors. Matter of fact, when I graduated from high school, um, I didn't get most likely to succeed. I got I got the award teacher's pet. So right, <laughs> <laughs> it tells you everything you need to know. So yeah, I used to, I don't know if she's still alive, but I everybody knew her because I never referred to her as Brenda Sands. Um she had, you know, back in the days in the eighties, we the hair was much bigger and mm-hmm. she was very put together. She was all back, you know, very pristine. So I called her Brenda Bay hairspray. Um so, <laughs> Because so, if, if once you get to know me, you know that's kind of who I am. Um, so anyway, but I, you know, to these many years, I still honor her with being. I don't forget. Um, you know, I forget. My, I remember my fourth grade teacher very well, and went back to her um, to sh- w- how pivotal she was in sort of changing me and and making me a um, good student. So you know, you, you try not to forget. We're on the shoulders of giants always. Um, people that have done great things for us, and so I try to remember them. So I honor her by talking about. That's well, you know, and you were talking a little bit about this as to, you know, being an, a, a, as a plastic surgeon, you were talking obviously of the education and the training side of it, but like all doctors, there's a time in, uh, which you treat patients and, you know, with your specialty, are there certain challenges that are unique to when, you know, dealing with patients that are different than in your specialty and maybe other specialties? Well, I think um, more recently over the last decade, um, it has been. Well, you know, I do fully aesthetic medicine now, so it's all paid um, without insurance involvement. Um, so I think there's a certain level of expectation. I will tell you, when somebody is coming to see you, it's mostly because they've been referred by their friends or family or reputation. Um, it's not because your colleagues or other doctors refer them, which is much how it happens in medicine, in insurance-based medicine. It's who you went to school with is who you refer them to. So right. you, you, depending upon your previous work, as guiding on the next patients for that. Um, and that's sort of how it's been. Um, I think that that puts its new challenges because now patients start totally normal other than they have an aesthetic problem. They're not sick. You can't play, blame patient disease. So you're on the line to make sure there's no complications and there's no problems as much as possible because um, it's not good for business. They have a different expectation and you know that any problems they have you cr- help create. Um, I think that makes it a little different than when I was a general surgeon and um, and you had issues. You kind of went back to, well, it was a tough situation because we started with a patient who was very sick and had a problem. Um, more recently, I think it becomes more challenging because of the social media and the internet and marketing and that sort of things are credentialed online. Um, people do their research, um, either for the good or bad. Um, they have come in with expectations um, by pictures on the internet, which are often um, modified and more of right. everything else um, with misinformation. There's this kind of expectation that has been created, an illusion that's happened through social media, um, that things happen um, and everybody turns out perfect. And, you know, you take one perfect case out of a hundred that you did and you present that online for the next six months, but you don't show the other 99 that didn't quite have that exact same result. Um, I think it just sets up a different expectation. We spend a lot of our time unraveling what they came in with um, and then trying to re-educate and recreate. I think that's where I can be very powerful because I spend my life being an educator. Um, and so I, I take that on to make sure that I set the stage for you know what I can do, what their expectation should be, um, to make sure at the end I would like to under-promise and over deliver on my results. And so I think that just creates a little bit of a challenge, especially for young surgeons coming in, you know, it's, it's hard. That's really interesting. I, I, you know, I hear all the time, you know, the challenges in, in plastic surgery of identifying people that may have a, a body image disorder or something like that. But I, I'd never thought about it from the perspective of their whole expectations have been kind of reset by the, you know, by the social media channels. And their um, dysmorphia um, is created by those same social media channels, right? Because they're seeing these expectations and these looks and people, and they're presented at their very best place. I mean, it could be as much as what their lives are like, how what they're involved in, what activities, who are their friends are around, um, and exactly what their appearance is, is all, <laughs> so much um, 
not exactly what the reality is. And that sets up these patients trying to achieve something that's probably for most of us not really achievable. Um, it sets in that and they go to the plastic surgeon to try to get to that place. And that's, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I will tell you, as it relates to, you know, cosmetic surgery gone bad, like it goes too far, the patients have done too much. It takes two to tangle on that one. And it takes the patient that has some dysmorphia or poor expectations, but it also takes the doctor or the surgeon who steps into it to go down that path with them. And so I think that we could be the gatekeepers to that and to be the people who say, no, let's, let's, we, let's do something different. Let's redirect um, and help you up through that. Unfortunately, when you say no, they'll often go find somebody who will say yes. Totally agree. That's, That's really cool. Yeah. Great, yeah. great perspective. So uh, I know you give entire lectures on the business side of your specialty. And, and uh, so I'd love for you just to kind of pick one um, to, to touch on, like what, what are some business challenges in plastic surgery that are kind of unique to that? Yeah. Well, I think it's unique because we are a retail business and a, and a patient business derived in a retail type of environment, and yet we're still medicine, right? And so you always have this ethical dilemma. Um, is, you know, is, it skin, is selling skincare products in your practice is that truly medicine if I have something to gain on the other side of it, you know? And so I always find that balance. Am I overselling that procedure because that's how I make money on that procedure? I think it's a unique challenge. Um, that's why for so many years, um, so many of my injectors and estheticians, we didn't have on um, incentive plans because we didn't want them to be incentivized to oversell any products to sort of find that line. We do understand that in the business of any business, um, patients love incentive. And the truth is, I mean, sorry. Pay, um, employees love incentives. And I know as a plastic surgeon, the harder I work, I'm incentivized by that in the, in the exact same way. So um, I sort of had to mature in that. But I think that we, we find that as a challenge. Um, I think, you know, coming through COVID, um, you know, we were, we had a lot of uncertainty um, about what would happen to our specialty um, in it. And had I known that we would do so well after it, I could have enjoyed the seven weeks off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we were busy trying to figure it all out and trying to find PPP and, you know, things to, you know, to protect all of our patients and how we were going to reemerge. Um, as you guys all know, and I'm sure have talked about, um, you know, plastic surgery on the other side of COVID um, was very successful, so much so that surgical procedures in aesthetics increased by 60% um, in 2021. Um, so, but we'll see what happens. Now the question is, will we see a back, you know, a swing the other direction. I'm sure to some degree we will. Um, I think that what we, what I learned from that, and I'm taking that into my business sense of my business, is that um, patients often, what holds them back from doing procedures and why non-surgical procedures have become so popular is it's time. It's patients don't have time um, to recover and to get through surgery, surgery, so they'll do non-surgicals because the time, you think of all of us who are extremely busy, the time to take two or three weeks off to have your tummy tuck or your facelift is really like, oh, I'd love to do that, but that's not going to happen um, anytime soon, um, though we'd like to. And then I think the other is that um, patients had money, um, the stock market was good, um, they, had, they weren't traveling, they weren't going out to dinner, they weren't spending money on all those things, so they were um, buying putting pools in their yard and they were <laughs> buying boats and they were um, having cosmetic surgeries. What I, this is my assessment of course, <laughs> of what they're doing um, with it. So um, um, with that, but I do think, you know, I think it's, it's enhanced um, aesthetics. Um, it's surely created an emergence of a lot of many spas suddenly where you I mean, it's an explosion. We've definitely seen private equity interested in getting in the game of um, plastic surgery. Uh, we've become, We've had to become as doctors. You know, everybody knows. There's no mystery. Doctors are the worst business people, right? You've heard it a thousand times. You guys know you deal with them all the time. Um, um, so, but in, in, the, in aesthetics, or if you're really going to scale your business and or have a big business, um, you have to become businessmen um, as well. And you have to be able to speak some of that language if you're going to be successful um, in it. So I think we've had to go back and re-educate. And I think that's what I say. And I think Brad, was at my last one of my last lectures I gave in San Diego. I gave a 45 minute lecture 
talking about that. And I talk about employees and emerging, all the things. It was really just about how you have to think about your business and you can't delegate your responsibility. You're the leader of the organization. You're the CEO, um, either by title or by the fact that you are the surgeon in that practice. And to understand how to um, make business decisions, it becomes extremely important. And I think doctors aren't prepared for that. Um, and I think that, you know, that's where we try to help them um, to become a little smarter about the, such things. Those are all great points. I mean, and I, I think what I'll, I did, you know, I, I think I told uh, Michael um, afterwards how much I enjoyed your, your presentation because you did hit on so many elements of just in general. Um, and, and this particular for our audience members, Brad was when he was speaking on this. Uh, he was really focusing on the aesthetic non-invasive side uh, as to why it's so lucrative if you do it correctly. And and I think, Brad, I don't know if you've ever heard the story, but Michael and I were giving a speech in Vegas once and we had a, an older physician, much older than anyone on this podcast, get up to the mic and tell us to our face, we were talking about med spas, that med spas are lost leaders. Anyone who wants a med spa, it's a waste of your time and waste of your money. And meanwhile, you know, we're sitting up there, we know, at the time, you know, med spas are making three or four million dollars a year. And it's just yeah. because they weren't treating it like businessmen. They were treating it as a, a separate entity that they weren't paying attention to because they make so much more money on the other side of the aisle. So I think your leadership and I know that you're very uh, vocal, both the, um, with the fellows, because uh, you and I spoke with the different fellowship symposiums over the yeah. years. Yeah. That, that leadership is so good for the plastic surgeons because I do agree with you. They're getting lapped by non-core doctors because they were just so concentrating on the surgical side. Well, you, yeah, I, you said everything just perfectly. Um, that's what it is. And, you know, we can make a lot of money in plastic surgery side of it. And it seems like a waste. You know, if you're talking about getting a, taking a 50% margin um, versus a 10% margin, but it takes 50% of that margin, it takes me actually doing all that work. At 50% at the best, you know, still good comparatively because the overhead's much greater on the mini spa business, but you can scale it up. And you can use um, extended providers, et cetera, to do it. So, you know, in as you guys, as Brad knows, he was my financials, you know, so I started the business. So when I opened, opened Calo Spa and Calo Stakes is a separate building in 2007. Um, so now we're 15 years into it. You know, you create a brand. I mean, you brand the Calo Spa and, and, and now we have multiple locations and it expands far beyond. You are the foundation of it, but expands far beyond what you can do in your own practice, it's good for the practice because it, it brings patients in for plastic surgery as well, too. But, you know, we have I'm scaled up to, you know, I think this year um, we'll do 13 or $14 million in our medical spa uh, business, which even if you're at a, low, you're at a lower margin, you know, a 20% margin or 25% margin, it can be being a lot of revenue. But what I said in that lecture, you know, what I was trying to say is, was what you just said, Brad, is if you don't have the energy or the bandwidth to put the energy in that's going to take for it, um, then you can't do it because it will be a loss leader and it won't be successful. Um, so you have to be willing to work hard and know who you are. I, so I think I said, are you a, a don't miss the boat or don't sink the boat kind of person? Um, <laughs> right. So are you the person who doesn't want to miss the boat and wants to be able to really build something special? Or are you very cautious and you don't want to sink the boat and things are going well as a plastic surgeon? Why would I mix that up? Um, you have to know who you are going into it um, if you're going to be successful. Because don't do not do what I did if you don't aren't willing to do what I did to get that's willing to risk to get there, um, et cetera. Um, I was told when I was building this building, oh my God, like, you know, you're doing great on my, for your business and 12 employees, you know, you are great. Um, and I'm so glad I didn't listen to that, you know, because now I have 85 employees, we have multiple locations, um, and I've definitely scaled it beyond my own practice. And and beyond that, I feel proud of it, and I've enjoyed yeah. it, and I know a lot, and I know a lot of people. And um, so the experience has been really, really good, too. I'm smarter at plastic surgery because I'm sm smarter at non-surgical um, treatments for my patients. That's so well said. And P.S., I'm going to have to steal that expression of don't seek the boat or uh, <laughs> don't, miss the, don't boat. miss the boat. Yeah. yeah. I love that. That very powerful. Yeah. I can't believe it again. We're already uh, have flown through our time together. Um, thank you so much yes. for coming on. What we'll do next, uh, Brad is we'll 
uh, say goodbye. We'll go to commercial and then I'll pick back up with Sir Brad to uh, <laughs> have a, a little legal wrap up on the other side. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team, so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad Adato, and my co host, Michael Bird. You know, Michael, this season we're having a specialist spotlight. We're bringing on all these amazing uh, individuals, and we just had uh, Dr. Brad Calabrese, not to be confused with Sir Brad over here. And he had so many great takeaways. I know we've said this before in other podcasts already. I mean, easily could have gone on for another 30 minutes just hearing his thoughts on a lot of different areas. But because we're focused on plastic surgery, he brought some great points to light, which is, you know, ultimately you you have a retail side of it, but you're still practicing medicine. And maybe for our audience, the last few minutes we have together, just highlight some of the legal implications of what he meant by that. Yeah. And and there's some very real pressures if you're in this kind of plastic surgery, even elective medicine, because you're the way you get business is going to feel like retail. You have to convince people to choose to come and get a treatment. And and, and at its core, this is the practice of medicine. Yes. And you can't let hold of that. And the threats to that are not going to be obvious. So you're like, I, I need to get you know a new sales technique to come in. And you hire a salesperson. You may have a retail background, so you know you're going to bring that in. And you could inadvertently violate, uh, you know, kickback laws or other laws like that with how you structure compensation to them or to your employees. Uh, you bring in, you know, website people that may come from other industries that are really good for business to draw in patients, but they have no idea about the regulations that go with false and deceptive advertising we've talked about in prior episodes. Yes. And so really at its or I think the takeaway is understanding at, at the very foundation of your business, you're a medical practice, and there are regulations across the many things you do from a business perspective. And so, you know, you just have to check, navigate that, check the boxes, navigate that as you try to be creative in running the business like a retail business. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all really good takeaways in that sense. And so, you know, I think, as Michael said, you know, just remember, it is the practice of medicine ultimately, and there will be other rules surrounding that. But Michael, that, believe it or not, we are way past our normal time. So let's move on, audience. Next Wednesday show, we have another special spotlight on ambulatory surgery centers with Woody Moore. Berta Dotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Berta Dotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.